in here in Acts chapter 20. Well, um, this is the greatest pastor's conference in the Bible. I really believe so. Paul is finishing up his second missionary journey. Uh, pardon me, third missionary journey. And he's on his way back to Jerusalem. But he says, let's uh, head in to the, the little port city of Ephesus. It wasn't little. Ephesus was good size. And in Ephesus, he says, go call the elders that I had appointed a couple years ago. Let's all get together here on the beach. And I just want to see him. I want to get a hug on him. And I want to say the last few most important elements and concepts about being a pastor and about being an elder, a leader. Very, very important. So we covered the first half probably two Sundays ago, and now here we are in the second half of chapter 20, and we're going to see part two of the greatest pastor's conference ever. Are you guys ready? Chapter 20, please. Let's start with verse 25. And indeed now I, Paul, know that all you guys, you pastors and elders on this beach with me, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, you're going to see my face no more. Paul knows that his days are numbered. He knows it. He absolutely does. At first, they're all, they, they suck in a sharp breath. What? Now, because I'm not going to be with you much longer anymore, verse 26, therefore, I've got to testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. What does he mean by that? In your margin, you should have Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18. That was uh, when God says to Ezekiel, hey, Zeke, I'm going to call you to be a watchman on the wall. That would be familiar to Ezekiel. That's the guy that when everybody else was in bed sleeping, your watchman on the wall is supposed to be awake with a cafe latte or something similar. And he's supposed to be looking and watching. Now, if he sees an army coming, and if he says nothing then everybody who is killed as they overrun the fortification, their blood is going to be on your head, Mr. Watchman. So that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, I'm, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, meaning I am a watchman on the wall, and I have shared and taught everything I know. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. <clears throat> last two Sundays, we've been taking a closer look at that. When Paul says the whole counsel of God, what he's meaning is Isaiah 28, verse 10. Line upon line, line upon line. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. And then what he's saying is, when Isaiah wrote that, that's how the priests in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, that's what they did too. Line by line. Now, why did we take a lot of time with that? Because this shepherd believes it is crucial for the body of Christ to learn their Bibles. You might have noticed it's the habit of many churches that they're going to probably give you a steady diet of kind of topical messages. Today, I want to talk about fear. Today, I want to talk about, you know, finances. And sometimes there'll be a week after week of a series. Now, I, I'm okay with topical messages now and again. But what is Paul saying? When I was doing my teaching, here's how I did it. I did it the whole council. And in Paul's day, that would have been Genesis to Malachi. What would he say today with the 27 books of the New Testament? I believe with all of my heart. He would say, hey, Steve, shepherd of God's flock. You better teach the people verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Why is that important? Because I think without a systematic study of verse 1 and chapter 1 to the end, it is too easy to get snippets of God's truth, but never the whole verse in proper context. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, we looked at last week. I want to just remind us all about it. Paul says this to Timothy. In 2 Timothy, that's his last correspondent he will ever write anyone. That's amazing. If you knew that this was the very last letter to your most precious soul, what would you say? Would you save the most important things for that letter? 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Hey, Timothy, don't ever forget that all Scripture, we saw that last week, that word is graphe, the written word. Harvest, always remember, okay? Um, whether it's a commentary or listening to a pastor, the Bible's graphe, written words, are inspired divinely. What pastor says may not always be so. Are you okay with that? It's an important understanding. The graphe, the written word, is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine. What is truth? For reproof. What is false? For correction. How do I change destructive lifestyles and habits? For instruction in righteousness. How to do the right thing. That the man of God may be complete. Huge word. Holocleros, and it means all of my compartments. We joked a bit last week. We said, how many of you have any blind spots? And some of you went, I don't think I have any blind spots at all. How many of you have blind spots? Stuff you just don't see. We all have them. Did you know that a systematic study of God's word at the right time, the Holy Spirit will show us, show me my blind spots. says so. Complete. Holocleros, all of my compartments. And then we will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Verse 28. Therefore, you guys here on the beach with me, take heed to yourselves and to the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's the Greek word episkopos. Six other times in Scripture, the same word for overseers is translated bishop. It means a diligent, diligent to guard and to guide. That's what the word means. And also to you guys, to shepherd. That's a great Greek word. It's the Greek word poimaio. E-I-E-I-E-O. (laughs) Poimio. And what it means is six times this word is, is translated feed. If you're going to be a shepherd, you had better feed. And that's where the word uh, pastor comes from. If you didn't know, this is the word that will be um, sort of translated into our English as pastor. What is a pastor? It means shepherd. It means a poimaio. These are people that are supposed to feed the sheep. Are they supposed to, you know, I'm not even going to go there. Shepherd, pastor, what did Jesus say to Peter? Peter, do you love me? Yes. Cheerlead my sheep. Administrate a tremendous organization that's traded on uh, the Dow Jones. No. Uh, Right, um, best-selling this or whatever that. Peter, if you love me, you will not be able to help it. You will want to what? Feed my sheep. Where do elders and pastors come from? This is pretty important. After all, we are in the midst of a pastor's conference. I think that there are four steps, four steps that I personally have noticed. I've been in and around the church, oh my, 40 years. Does that make me, do I look older now suddenly? I sometimes, Mike, I sort of lament that we, uh, that we broadcast in HD. Don't zoom in. Please, please don't zoom in. I've been around the church a long time, Harvest. It doesn't make me an expert necessarily, but I have noticed some things over the years. I think to be an elder or pastor, I see four important steps. Step number one, I believe if God is calling you to be an elder or a pastor, How will I know? The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord. Interesting term. Um, There's the spinning wheel of the potter's wheel, and it's spinning around. You you moisten your hands, and you're like, Demi more. No, 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 I don't don't want to do that one. I've had the time of my life. Oh, this brain of mine, the cinema brain of mine. There's the lump going around, and then the potter moistens his fingers And then he begins to apply pressure to the lump. And as it spins, you'll notice the lump begins to take on a beautiful form. That's this word delight. 
Hey, lumps of clay, stop elbowing back God's loving pressure. Yeah, but Steve, it's uncomfortable. I know. He is so difficult. She has been the bane of my existence. Is it possible that they could be part of God's gentle, sometimes not so gentle, pressure? Because like the potter's lump, he wants to form something beautiful in you. Delight yourself. Hey, lumps, stop fighting. If you do that, you delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. As you know, some people twist that as, oh, I would like a brand new car. That's not how it works. When you stop elbowing God back and you become moldable in the hands of a mighty potter, so to speak, did you know that, do you know that he drops into your heart what he wants you to do? That's how it works. Um, I remember, I've told this story before, but I remember becoming a Christian and reading powerful stories of missionaries. Powerful stories. Real Book of Acts type stuff. Demons cast out. Dead people being raised. It is documented. It has happened. And on the one hand, woo, wouldn't that be good to be slinging some Book of Acts type bullets for Jesus? Blah, 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 blah. You know, woo. And then the thought occurred to me, I don't want to be a missionary. I wish I was, what, braver, more whatever. Uh, I don't want to live in a jungle, and I don't want to go to a foreign where they won't have Starbucks. I'm just letting you know that right now. Is God probably calling me to be a missionary? No. You ask a missionary who's been there, um, when did it occur to you that you wanted to be a bit missionary? And they'll typically will tell you a story of a verse read or some time of quiet time with the Lord. There it was. I've got to go. I've got to go. Delight yourself in the Lord. Stop elbowing his creative pressure on your life. He will drop into your heart and your mind what he wants you to do. How do you become a pastor? What's the proper biblical steps of becoming an elder? Step one, do you find that you have an uncommon love for God's word? I think that's an important one. For some reason, uh, it's not like you've got to get into God's word. You get to. and You can't wait. Is it possible that he's the one who gave you that strong desire to read and to study God's word? And then... When you're studying with a commentary in a Bible dictionary and digging into Greek words, <laughs> geek words as sometimes have referred to me, see even enough with this and the history and the that, I love it. And if you find that you have an uncommon love for God's word and you're doing the digging, well, see, when you're getting to God's word, it gets into you. And it begins to overflow, and you got to tell somebody. i got to tell somebody. <laughs> years and years ago, when Steve was walking on the wild side, I don't really have to go into that, do I? I'm going to call that years 1990 to about 1995. Papa Sal says, boy, what he was doing. And even in the very depths of me not walking with the Lord, there was Nicole and I, and we were in our large casino's uh, employee dining room, the EDR. There was a book flying around, you might remember it, Left Behind. Remember the book series? In the early 90s, uh, Left Behind, the first one had come out, and we had noticed, both Nicole and I, that in this EDR, the dealers smoking their cigarettes and flipping through Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye's first novel, Astounding. It was amazing. And then there I was uh, at my table eating, and then the discussion began to formulate, how about that book, you know, about the rapture? It starts out on an airplane, and Buck, you know, he, suddenly all these people are gone, and Rayford comes out, what's going on? I'm eating my... my my lunch. 
What's up with the rapture? Anybody have an idea? Eating my lunch. <laughs> you know, I heard that that book of Daniel, that book of Revelation, eating my lunch, I couldn't stop me overflowing with this strong unction. Say something. I'd walked with the Lord many years in front of the early 1990s, but ran into a buzzsaw. I know none of you know what I'm talking about. Ran into a buzzsaw of some of the most debilitating defections ever, ever in my life. And like many, I said, man, the church. You know, Jesus I love. That'll never change. But, boy, the church. Boy, the church. A lot of people behaving badly then. Even some who had the name badge, pastor and elder. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. So there was the EDR. And soon I began to open my mouth because I had to. I just really did. Well, you know, here's what the Bible says. And then Nicole and I look up and around our little table at the EDR, they're too deep listening to a backslidden former minister who even in his most backslidden state was bursting with the heart and the word of God. I'll never forget that. Where do elders and pastors come from? Step number one, do you have an uncommon love for God's word? And when you're away from it too long, you can't stand it. He's gonna give you the desires of your heart and then the de desire of your heart begins to move to health and well-being of God's people. It concerns you that God's people, God's sheep, so to speak, are taken good care of. And instead of complaining about why not this in the church and why that in the church, you say, I think I can do something. Lord, here am I, send me. So you ask the pastor, where can I help? And it doesn't bother you when he says, well, we could sure use somebody vacuuming the floor, cleaning the restrooms. I never forget Pastor Chuck. He's on staff at another church long ago, and he was in charge of sweeping up the cigarette butts on the outside of the church. So people, when they come out of the parking lot, they'd, you know, they'd kind of drain the last of their cigarette, and then they'd grind it out in their heel and walk in, you know, and exhale. <gasps> And there's Pastor Chuck, uh, an assistant pastor at his church at the time. And he's picking up these cigarette butts on the outside of the church. What do they think? The half-life of a cigarette butt is 25 seconds. It's going to stay there a long time. People and their cigarette butts. And the Lord busted his heart. That's uh, pretty upsetting, isn't it, Chuck? Sure is. Your, your people. I love. And if you love me, you should love them too. And he said a sudden change came over his heart. I wouldn't say he started whistling Dixie, pissing, picking up uh, cigarette butts, but his whole heart changed. Harvest, when you have an uncommon love for God's word, it gets in you and it comes through you. And one of the first things you notice is, I want to serve and to take care of God's people. Step number two. Once you do that, you find out that the Holy Spirit is going to move through you. He is. Because he has given you the desire to serve, he has gifted you to do it. And then, without even trying, because you're in the Word so much, coming out of your life is love and joy and peace, and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And then people that are around you, they begin to notice that about you as well. And pretty soon when God needed a pastor to guide and to guard three million people through the desert, where did God find Moses? At the university level? At his seminary graduate school? Where did he find Moses? Exodus 3 verse 1. What was Moses doing? He was watching the sheep. He was. And after the disastrous rule of the people's choice for king, King Saul, where did God find Israel's greatest king? 
according to 1 Samuel 16. What was David doing? He was watching the, that's how it goes, harvest. That's how it goes. Now step three. You do that a while, then the sheep begin to notice. Step number three. The sheep see it. Jesus said, my people hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If a person is flowing with God's word, a passion to protect and serve God's people, fruit over time, people will see it, and they will trust and receive from you. I want to start out teaching a Bible study. People only care how much you know when they know how much you care. I know that's a bumper sticker, but it really is true. And then that will lead you to step number four. Then after that happens, fruit over time, then the present pastor and or elders, they're going to see it too. And because they know 1 Timothy chapter 3, and they know Titus chapter 3, don't lay hands quickly. They're going to watch you for a while. Well, how long? Six months? Seven months? A year? Tick tock, tick tock. They're going to wait until there becomes a universal Yes. And then they will appoint you. So there's those four steps. Back to our pastor's conference. We're going to head up to verse number 29. Now, why is it important for pastors, shepherds, and elders, and bishops to feed the sheep line by line, verse by verse? And here really is the balance of our time together this morning. Because wolves are coming. Wolves are coming. Verse 29. For I know this, says Paul to his pastors and elders on the beach of Ephesus, that after my departure, savage wolves are going to come, and they're going to come in among you, and they're not going to spare the flock. Verse 30. And also from among yourselves, elders and pastors, men will rise up, speaking perverse things. Why? because they want to draw away the disciples after themselves. This is so crucial, Harvest. We sure would love to think that uh, church is a wonderful place where um, nice people get nicer. Wouldn't that be great? Um, the Bible says that the heart of man is exceedingly wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? What's the answer? Nobody, not even you. Jesus is saying, enemy is so crafty that he is going to get into the church in seven powerful ways. We don't have time to turn there, but if we did, we would go to Matthew 13. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is going to give us seven what are called kingdom parables. And these seven parables are, here's what's going to happen with the church. It's prophetic. The kingdom of heaven is like, and here it goes. Number one was... Did you know that demons slash wolves are going to blind God's people from the truth? That's going to be happening in the church. That's the birds eating the seed. Number two, there's going to be lots of unsaved in church. They're going to look like Christians, but actually they're quite destructive. That's sowing tares among the wheat, by the way. What's the only way that you know that they are wheat versus tares? You can only tell by their fruit. Then number three, the mustard seed, if you analyze that, it grew to be a huge tree. If you know your herbs, mustard plants are what? Maybe this big. And when Jesus says it becomes a huge tree, everybody went, what tree? That's the point. In some cases, the church is going to grow unnaturally large. And who is nesting in the branches? Birds. And Jesus told us when birds are employed in an idiomatic or model similar metaphor, they are always a model of the demonic. Restated. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Some churches are going to grow so unnaturally large, they're actually going to be bird sanctuaries. Some of us all, what? May the Lord lead us all. 
Verse number four. Then the fresh, um, there will be in the church fleshly churchgoers, and they're going to be destroying the peace and fellowship. That's the leaven sowed in three measures of meal. I've got teachings on that if you want to run that down. The measure, the leaven in three measures of meal, three measures of meal, that was the fellowship offering. That's what Abraham said, hey, Sarah, when the three dudes show up. Go make the three measures of meal. You run that down. It's a fellowship offering. Did you know that Jesus said that any church you go to, would you mind saying any church? Maybe even this one. Actually, actually in this one. They're going to be fleshly churchgoers who are destroying the peace and the fellowship. It shouldn't surprise us, but it happens triangulating is a big one. Then uh, parables number five and six, pastors must value God's people first. That was the treasure hidden in a field. That was the pearl of great price. By the way, pearl, where does a pearl come from? It comes from an oyster. Is an oyster a kosher diet? No. What? In heaven, there are 12 pearls, pearly gates. And if you know the kosher laws, if you know your Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are you supposed to eat oysters? No, they're non-kosher. Where does a pearl come from? It comes from an irritant that gets into the little, he's all, (laughs) and so he coats it with some pearlescent uh, mineral, and it grows and grows and becomes a pearl, if you will. In heaven are a bunch of former irritants that have been covered by a glorious Savior. I can't get a little amen for that one. Jesus finds a pearl. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who finds a pearl of great price. Could you read that potentially? Hey, pastors, you must value God's people first because in the parable... That guy sold everything he had for it. Is it possible that there will be pastors that really aren't in it for God's people first? They're in it for themselves. Um, they got a vision. That's the, that's the treasure hidden. And then number seven, we should pay close attention to that one. That's the dragnet. What's that? Did you know that Jesus is saying that in the church there are going to be many, not a few, Many that on judgment day, what are they going to say to Jesus? But, but Lord, I, I, I went to my studies. I did my groups. I did my programs. I cast out demons in your name. And I will say to them, I, I never knew you. And that's such a shock. What? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. Would it be illogical if Jesus said, I never knew you, that you were once saved and he did know you, but then he doesn't remember you anymore? This is saying that in the church, there are going to be people who will go to church Sunday after Sunday, and they're not saved. They never were. Wow. No matter what these wolves say, no matter how holy they sound, how cool the program's, Like Lucifer, the true motivation of all wolves is to build their own kingdom. Oh, I've seen it so many times in the church. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, by their fruit, you're going to know them. The fruit of godly shepherds is look around them. You're going to see love and joy and peace and patience and self-control and healthy sheep. By the way, what do healthy sheep do without even trying? They reproduce more healthy sheep. That's how it goes. If a pastor's ever banging the pulpit, you guys need to witness more. Come on. I can almost guarantee you that that pastor never shares his faith. I just think so. What do you mean? When it exudes from the pastor, whatever exudes from the pastor is more caught than taught. I believe it. My job is to teach you God's word, verse by verse by verse. But if you hang out with me or my wife anytime for any length of time, hopefully you're going to, is this bad? 
You're going to smell a little like us. <laughs> You're going to find yourself potentially saying things that you heard us say because it makes logical sense and has a certain spiritual foundation. Matthew 7 says, by their fruit you will know them. How are you going to know a healthy biblical sheep? Because there's going to be fruit all around them. And there's going to be healthy sheep reproducing. The fruit of wolves dressed like sheep or shepherds. Has any wolves ever made it to the pulpit? Yes. What is their fruit? Um, dead sheep. Their life is dead. Their walk is dead. They're surrounded by divisions and contentions and triangles, church splits, and divorces. Gosh, do I have a um, bloody story after bloody story on that. Harvest, how many of you want to grow in Jesus Christ? I know I do. If you're relying on this shepherd to be your main source of biblical wows and understandings, and, and you're only getting your diet from this joker, this knucklehead, once a week, I just got to let you know, you're, you're anemic. You're, you're not strong. And the enemy knows that, that humans can only go so far on their own gas tank, and then pretty soon they're going to they're gonna sort of sputter and stop. And the enemy may not be able to touch you on a Sunday or even a Monday, maybe even a Tuesday. But if you're not in word, worship, prayer, and fellowship every day, he just waits till you wind down on Wednesday. And I don't really want to go to church on Wednesday either because, I don't know, my show or I'm tired, whatever it might be, I get it. I don't want to go to Tuesday night prayer because, well, I know. Insert your reasonings there. But what if you did? What if you came by and you're getting into God's word every single day and you're a word, worship, prayer, and fellowship perhaps on a Tuesday and or a Wednesday, the enemy can't get at you. You know how it goes, right? If you work for the treasury department and your job is going to be spotting counterfeit $100 bills, what's the best training that the FBI and the treasury department has done to train good counterfeit spotters? They don't show them counterfeit bills because there's too many of them. What do they do? They learn the real thing over and over and over. And when the counterfeit comes across their notice, they'll spot it every time. Harvest, you're not going to discover a wolf if you're not in God's word on a consistent basis. They're too slick. They're so slick that many wolves... Don't believe that they are wolves. True story. Um, hold your finger here. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, James, please. The book of James. Hebrews, James, Peter. Find James and go to chapter 3. We, we do this a lot. I hope you don't tire of it. But James, Jesus' half-brother, he was the pastor there at the church of Jerusalem. He would eventually become martyred because he would not deviate from the truth. And even the church there in Jerusalem got filled up with some wolves and James is killed for his faith. But before he does, chapter 3, uh, James, look down there to verse number 13. James 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? How many of you are smart? And then we may not say it out loud, but how many of us go, well, I'm pretty smart. We all do. We all believe that I'm the real deal. I got this, I got this. It's a big part of who we all are. Who is really wise and understanding among you? And some of us will say under our breath, <laughs> me? Okay. Well, then let him show by a good conduct or lifestyle. We would say, what's your fruit? That his works are done in meekness, wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, is there something that you are kind of bugged either at God or somebody else because they have something that you want? Uh, John Carson says, what is envy? Envy is wanting more of something God has already given you plenty of. Not enough, God. I want more. If you've got bitter envy, why is he teaching? 
If you have better in, bitter envy or self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Because I ask you, who is wise and who is a real leader? Well, that's me. Really? What's your fruit? Verse 15. This kind of wisdom, this kind of fruit of a wolf does not descend from above. It is earthly, worldly. It is sensual. Not sexy, but senses. How does it make me feel? They are feeling run in their lives. That's who the quarterback is in their life. How do I feel about it? And look at this. Who's behind it all? Demons. It is demonic. Are there wolves in the church? Yes, there are. Paul is saying, I've been doing this a long time, you guys. And every single church that I started, as soon as I left, after I appointed pastors and elders, here came the wolves. And they wear the name badge of holy, smart, I got this, I got this. I know more than you. They exude often a sense of science, kind of pseudo-scholarship. They seem to know their Bible more than you do. What's the fruit? Is there bitter envy? Are they grinding on their previous church or pastor? That's a big one. Well, why don't you go to that church anymore? Why are you coming here? Because that pastor is a knucklehead. And then they'll tell you and spin their sad story. Don't lie. This is not wisdom from above. Now, verse 16. For wherever envy and self-seeking exist, look at this. Confusion and every evil thing are there. There is your wolf. Now, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above, here's what it looks like. It is first pure. You might be able to say selfless. It's pure. Then it is peaceable. You notice that there are some people that have a large personality and a capable dialect and an impressive delivery style. And there's a kind of compelling sort of way about them. But look around their own life, their own marriage, their children, their family, and is there peace? Gentle. Here's a big one. Willing to yield. <laughs> um, I got to make this a little more uh, closer to home. Hey, Harvest, when you and your spouse are in one of those interesting dialogue exchange times, <laughs> you kind of know what I'm talking about on that one. Are you willing to yield? What do you mean? He or she starts talking, and you're not really listening. You're just building your rebuttal. And as soon as they draw a breath, you jump right in. Blam, 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 blam. <laughs> Look at this. You think you're smart? You think you've got this? Your side of the argument is so ironclad true? Really? then is it willing to yield? Full of mercy, is there fruit behind it? Or is there yelling and, and I'm, I'm going to dominate with the volume of my voice? Or in some cases, you brothers, be careful. You are bigger than your spouse. Don't you dare ever bow up on them. Good fruits, with, full of mercy, good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now watch this, verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in what? Peace. We sang about it this morning. By those who make peace. Make peace. Uh, write in your margin here, would you mind? Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. I want to give you the actual verse. Proverbs 16. 16, I'm going to get there, Michael, I promise. Proverbs 16, verse 7. Proverbs 16, verse 7. Do you mind dipping there quickly, please? Proverbs 16, verse 7. Watch this. Especially when the enemy is trying to get spouses grinding on each other. How do you know it's not God? Well, look at the fruit. At the end of it, is truth been established? Or have we just kind of divulged into fighting about how we always fight. Look at this. Proverbs 16, verse 7. 
When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at what? Peace with him. Not everybody loves Pastor Steve. I got to tell you that. I hope that doesn't break your heart. Mike, I'm just letting you know. There's people, they don't like me very much. <laughs> I wish they did, but they don't. Have I given some reason for some? Potentially. But this idea of peace, here's what it says. There are people that don't like me much at all, and they have their reasons, but did they do Matthew 18? They're bugging me, but did they come to me, and did they do what the Bible tells us, instructs us? If someone has been offended, you go to them, and you try to reconcile, and if they won't hear, you bring two more. You know the drill. And if they won't listen to you and the two, then you bring them before the church. There are too many people, take me out of the picture, and there are people that are grinding on you. Are you open to the fact that they may have something to say? Instead of saying, well, they're a great big fat jerk, that's why they don't like me. Or are you Matthew 18, is there any sort of shepherd heart in any fiber of your being that says, the body of Christ is injured and separated I'm going to go to them and ask them, what have I done? And then James chapter 3, am I willing to yield? Am I willing to listen? Am I willing to sit down and reason together? And what does Matthew 18 say? say? If you do that with a right heart, you have won your brother. But if not, when you see them in the store, oh, there they are. Is that what Proverbs 16, verse 7 says? When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at what? Peace. Uh, back to the book of Acts, and we'll zoom to the end. Harvest, that's a big one. You're not sure about something? Get out your Galatians 5. Run it through the fruit of the, the Spirit. Looks like this. The works of the flesh look like these. Be honest. Psalm 139, Lord, is there more fruit of the flesh regarding this issue, or is there fruit of the Spirit? Back to the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember for that, that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Hey, do you want to be a leader in God's church? You have to understand that tears go with the job. It, that's just how it goes. Verse 32. So now, brethren, pastors and elders, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance um, among all those who are sanctified. Um, God, godly biblical shepherds are rare. They really are. I just got to let you know. Godly biblical shepherds that last more than a few years are rarer still. Paul is saying that there's more tears than rewards, but one day. Mm. He says to Timothy in that letter, 2 Timothy, Timothy, I'm weeks away from my own execution, and he says, quote, I have fought the good fight. I did it. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, and finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Now, I know, I know, uh, most of us don't worry about, well, rewards don't really matter. And that really is the right attitude. Rewards don't matter, say most godly servants. I do it for him and for heaven. That is the right heart. But don't miss what Paul is saying here. In heaven, there will be rewards. And on that day, it will matter. Verse 33. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Oh, my. How is that different, so different from today's popular prosperity doctrine? Please see this. I don't want your money. I didn't want gold. I didn't want fine clothes. Is there anybody, pastors, are they seeing something opposite to this? Wolves. They're wolves. Verse 34. Yet you yourselves know that these hands have provided my necessities. While in Ephesus, it seems he didn't take a salary. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to pay your pastors because Paul will teach in other areas. Of course you are. And he goes back to Old Testament um, uh, laws to say so. But when he was in Ephesus, 
Interestingly enough, he didn't take any money from anyone. Fascinating. How did he make his living? Do you remember? He made tents. Mm -hmm. For those who were with me, and for those who were with me, and I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How many of you ever heard that one in church? Please notice the context here. This is for who? The pastors. This is said to pastors. Yes, it is a universal truth. You cannot outgive God. And giving to God is giving to Him. And we're not giving money, time, talent, and resources. We're giving away greed and unfaithfulness and not trusting Him. That's what tithing is really about. But in this particular instances, instance, how many pastors trying to build a building fund a vision? I got a vision. Or just get rich. How many of them have pointed this verse at their congregation? They didn't have the context right. Wolves. Wolves. And when they're inevitable, or here, pardon me. Paul is saying biblical ministry is feeding the sheep, serving the flock. It's hard work. And if you are a biblical shepherd or leader, it is hard. You are giving way more than you get back. That's what he's saying. And much of what you pour into people, they will not use. And they're not going to change. I just got to let you know that. And Paul is saying that to these guys. And... When their inevitable crash comes, because they won't listen to you, they're going to blame you for their lot in life. It happens. In the book of Numbers, we've been seeing that. You brought us out here to die, Moses. Was Moses leading them or was God leading them? And does God lead you anywhere just to blow you up? You did this to us, Moses. 38 years later... They're complaining that there's nothing to eat out in this desert. <laughs> and it's your fault, Moses. You promised this land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, oh, oh. They didn't like him. Sorry for that face. <laughs> Look at that one in HD. No, don't, don't do that. There's nothing to eat out here, Moses. It's your fault. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 38 years ago, if they would have listened to Moses instead of the 10 spies, where would they have been 38 years ago? In the promised land, up to their ears with what? Fruit. Harvest, it's a powerful picture. Old Testament pictures are New Testament principles. It looks silly on these people. Moses, there's nothing to eat. There's no fruit out here. It's your fault. Ah, whoa. Was it really Moses' fault or was it their fault? You see how it works? Paul is saying biblical ministry is feeding and serving. You're going to give out much more than you get back. And most of the people that you minister to and pray for and stay up sleepless nights fasting for, it's just a fact of the matter. Most of them are not going to change. They're not. And when their inevitable crash happens, they're going to blame you for it. They do. And then they're going to move to the next church and then tell that pastor and anyone else who will listen what a lousy pastor you were. How many want the job now? <laughs> hey, Ephesian pastors and elders, if you're in the ministry for any reason other than to feed and to serve, and would you do it if no one was looking? That's the only way that you're not going to get discouraged and quit. Or in the case of some, you might be a wolf. And you're going to do great harm to God's beloved church. That's why James will go on to say in chapter 3, or he started to say in chapter 3, Brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Because knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. Verse 36. How many of you guys want the job now? Verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he had spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him back to the ship. I want to read something for you. 
You need to know that it is the heart of this pastor to be a book of Acts shepherd. That's what I want. Well, don't you want a great big old church? No, not really. Well, what do you want? I want to be used by the Lord to feed his beloved sheep and hopefully do it in such a manner that you get a little excited about God's word. We have fun in prophecy. We have wonderful times in all the scientific foundations. And this geek gets geekified. And hopefully some of you have said, I had no idea that was in the Bible. I had no idea that the Bible anticipates scientific certainties thousands of years before the scientists ever caught up to it. Sorry, geek alert. Did you know that your Bible said that the earth is round 300 years before the first Greek mathematicians figured it out? Don't get me started. (laughs) Hopefully, hanging around this knucklehead, you have grown to appreciate the absolute supernatural message system that you hold in your lap. I hope that's true. It is very much the heart of this pastor to be a book of Acts pastor. Much of our systematic study through the book of Acts has been greatly inspired by my favorite pastor, Pastor John Corson. Verse by verse, pastor... He has been for more than 50 years. Here's what he said about the pastor's conference here in Acts chapter 20. Take a quick second. Abraham was a lover of God. And on his way to the promised land, whatever, wherever he went, he built an altar. Because the Lord prospered him more and more, his flocks began to increase. So he dug a few wells to ensure that his flocks were sufficiently watered. When Abraham's son Isaac came on the scene, seeing his father's expensive flocks, he decided the key to his father's success was digging wells. So Isaac dug many wells, but he built only one altar. It seems that he was too busy managing flocks and Other people constantly wanted his sheep. So he dug his wells and he named them Sitna, which means strife, if you know the story, and Esek, which means contention. When Isaac's son, Jacob, the third generation from Abraham, when he appeared, he didn't build any altars and he dug no wells. Instead, he said, The key to seeing the flock grow is ingenuity and creativity, the genetic engineering. Do you know the story of uh, Mr. Jacob, what he did? He he believed an urban myth. If if you feed sheep uh, uh, spotted and speckled food, they'll pop out spotted and speckled sheep. Because what he's really trying to do is stick it to his boss, Laban. Now, by the way, what a sheep eats, does that actually make the... No, it was an urban myth. But see the point. When Isaac's son Jacob, the third generation from Abraham, appeared, he didn't build any altars and dug no wells. Instead, he said, I know, the key of seeing the flock grow is ingenuity, creativity, and genetic engineering. That's what often happens, says John. A man or woman loves God and God's people, and from that love there's an overflow whereby the flock grows. Then the second generation says, well, I too want to be in the ministry, and I want to see the flock grow. So they copy the outward activity of the previous generation, but it only produces wells, tension, strife, and agony. Why? Because they're not altar builders. Finally, the third generation comes along and says, programs, that's the key. We will have excellent entertainment. We'll have relevant current messages. They might not be verse by verse, but they'll speak to the, quote, felt needs of the people. And it's exciting for a while, but it's not sustaining. They have to try harder and harder in their Jacob mentality to keep everything going with creativity and ingenuity. Then John says this. I see this happening not only in churches, but in my own life. Me too. In my own life as well. Quite frankly, 
I can go through all three generations in one day. I can begin the day as an altar builder. Just you and me, God. Kind of like what we did in our worship time today. A lover of God. Then sometime around noon, when my stomach begins to grumble, I can become a well digger saying, Lord, I don't have time to talk to you. I've got to water these sheep. And as a result, in the evening, I find myself thinking, oh, no, my joy, my peace is slipping. I know. I better do something creative and ingenious. Can you go to one more spot with me, please? And I promise I'll end here. Isaiah, please, chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. This is what I believe the Lord put on my heart for all of us here this morning. Book of Isaiah, please. Chapter 30. Book of Isaiah. Chapter 30, this is a section of the Bible where God's people are being, well, they're being classic God's people. (laughs) Chapter 30, please, book of Isaiah, look at verse 1. Chapter 30, Isaiah, here's verse 1. Harvest, if you've noticed this week that you're thirsty, you're hungry for something, but you don't know what it is. Can't quite put my finger on it. Psalm 84 says, you're actually thirsty for him. Woe to those, verse 1, Isaiah 30. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to watch Oprah. I'm going to do whatever it might be. I got this thing in the middle that's missing. I don't know what to do. I'll go to practically any other place than God's word. But not of me. And who devise plans, but not of my spirit. And what they do is then they add sin to sin. Who walk and go down to Egypt. Egypt is always a model of the world. So I'll see what the world's doing and see what makes them happy. And then I'll try to plug in the same methodology. Where does that always end up, Harvest? More hungry. In the interest of time, verse 15, please. Verse 15. For this says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel... Are you thirsty? How do I get back? In returning and, say this next word with me, rest. rest. Harvest. Get off the treadmill. No, no, I got to do my Beth Moore studies. I got I to gotta memorize my verse. Now, in and of themselves, those may be wonderful instruments, but if you're approaching God's well of water and his manna, With the wrong attitude, you'll still miss it. Rest. Peace. We sang it today. In returning and rest. Quiet times at an altar for him. Not busy. Not ministry. Him. Harvest, you have to believe God's word when it says, what you're missing is not an it. It is a who. In returning and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. Interest of time, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord is going to wait. Isn't that good? What? How was the last time you had an altar with the Lord? Willing to flop yourself on the altar. Paul said, be a living sacrifice. Isn't that a dichotomy in terms? Well, that's the problem with living sacrifices is they're still kicking. And they'll kick right off the old altar. Come to God's altar and rest. Therefore, the the Lord will wait. He's not mad at you. He'll wait. Come. Come back. Come home. Come. Now is the time to worship. (laughs) Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be, look, gracious. He's not mad at you. Oh, now you're going to come back, says the Lord. No, that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who what? Wait for him. And finally, verse 21. Please hear this. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? If you can rest and return and in your morning times get quiet alone with God's word and ask, search me, O God. Be willing to yield. 
Lay down your excuses. Verse 21. Then your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this way. I know how you're going to get through this. But remember, his voice is often a still small voice. And the reason you haven't heard him is because your life is loud. Get to an altar. Get to an altar. And this is the way. Walk ye in it. And whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left hand. How many of you need God's wisdom, God's direction today? Would you stand with me? Lord Jesus, this was, well, really not for anybody else in this room this morning. It was for me. Lord, what do you want a shepherd to do? Feed the sheep. But Paul said to them, but you better feed yourself first. Pastors who study the Bible strictly for what they're going to tell the congregation is not going to be very helpful. Steve, you got to get blown back. Your hair has got to get blown back by my word and truths every day for you because Book of Acts pastors should minister from the overflow of love, joy, peace, patience in the quiet times at the altar and then tell everybody about your lunch with Jesus. Now be careful, Book of Acts leaders, because there will be too many people that will want your lunch with Jesus, but they do not want to have their own Pastor, just here's my IV tube. Let me stick it into your joyous heart and enjoy your beautiful lunch with Jesus. Every head down and eye closed, please, for a quick second. Number one, are you born again? Are you a full-on believer? Please don't forget what Jesus said on Judgment Day. It's going to be a whole lot of people that thought they were. If that doesn't even bother you, it should. Are you truly born again? Well, how do I know? I said the sinner's prayer when I was 12. Yeah, but how's your fruit? How's your fruit? Are you triangulating? Have old things passed away? Is there a newness in your life? If not, today, right now, ask him, Lord Jesus I want to be born again. I want you to know me, and I desperately want to know you. My sheep hear my voice, said Jesus. The penetrating question this morning, have you heard the voice of the Lord? Do you hear it from his word? In the quietness of your own time, at the altar. Are you born again, Harvest? Ask him. Beg him to cover you and save you and fill you with his Holy Spirit. Would you do so now? Lord, I am yours. And the rest of us, hey, Harvest, are you tired or are you thirsty? Go to an altar, would you? In Jesus' name, and all the altar boys and girls said, amen. 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 Hey, God bless you. If you like some prayer, come up to the front. We'd love to pray with you. We'll see you on Tuesday night.